Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ken Kirschenbaum. Thanks for attending today's webinar, which is a presentation by Mitch Reitman about the importance of sound financial management and how to make your company bankable. Uh, so we're very uh, happy that you, you're you going to spend the next hour with us. If any of you have um, uh, bags of, uh, of uh, ballots in your trunk and you need to get it over to the voting uh, place soon, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, cut you loose so you can drive over there with your fake ballots. Um, so I know everyone's got, probably like me, got their eye on the election while Mitch is talking. And uh, uh, Mitch apparently has uh, lost his video feed. Mitch, you need to come back to us. Uh, so this is a follow-up in a way to the uh, Worcester webinars that we had, uh, which, which were very well received and attended. And, and uh, 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 Mitch, Mitch wanted to do a, a follow-up presentation to deal with issues, I guess, raised in, in those webinars, as well as a few issues that have uh, not, maybe were not raised in those issues. So as soon as he gets back here, we'll be happy to uh, turn it over to him. Well, here's an update. Uh, Biden has taken the lead in Michigan. Mitch, are you back? Can't sit here calling the election results. Can, can, can you hear me now? Is the audio working at least? I can hear you. We can't see you. Are you ready to? Okay. There you go. Okay, you're there. No, you're gone again. Okay, there seems to be a problem with the camera, but nobody really needs to see me. I'm gonna well, see you. You're back now. Screen. Don't move. Don't move. I'm gonna now turn it over to you. I know what to do. And make you. You're now a presenter. Your screen is going to take over from my screen, and I'm going to uh, mute myself and take down my video. So here is Mitch Reitman, the famous tax financial advisor and, and broker in the alarm industry from Texas, and, which, and voted, Ken, I'm, I'm which, voted, which yeah. voted red. I, was, I wasn't gonna let you make your presentation today, Mitch, if you didn't deliver. So, <laughs> and, and what excuse do I have here in New York? Okay. Well, I, it would be interesting to see if uh, either way it goes, there'd be a lot more work for us to do on the tax side because it's going to be even more confusing than it ever was. So, uh, well, if Bi I think if Biden get in, gets in, maybe they'll run De Blasio four years from now. That would be a good, a good, a good. <laughs> all right, here you go. Goodbye. Yeah, uh, can, can you see back to my PowerPoint? I've got all kinds of screens showing up. Are you're you? All, you're all set. Goodbye. Okay. Well, as as Ken said, I'm Mitch Reitman. I've, I've been practicing accounting this industry for. Uh, over 20 years, uh, our firm specializes in uh, in the security and access control, systems integration, and fire industry only. And uh, what I want to talk to you today is the uh, ability to make your company bankable and why it's important to be bankable, and uh, and and how to do it and how to go about it. And the first thing is to be bankable, you need to have sound financial management. And the reason why that's important is companies, especially in this space, thrive on cash flow. What does that mean? That service businesses like we are are cash intensive and they have what's called the cash cycle. And the cash cycle is your recurring revenues coming in, your install revenues coming in, and your payroll's going out and your materials are going out. That is your cash cycle. That is your basic cash cycle in this business and what you need to be able to manage. And liquidity in this industry is a precious resource. Uh, and liquidity is, is working capital. Working capital is your current assets and your balance sheet, less your current liabilities. That's a simple definition of liquidity without getting too technical. And the simple working capital definition, though, does not consider pure liquidity. And when I was back in graduate school 35 years ago or so, I would ask the uh, young bankers, young future bankers, what liquidity was. And they said, well, it's the ability to turn an asset into cash. And that's part of the answer. The real answer is it's the ability to turn an asset into cash at market value. You can turn cash into cash at market value pretty easily. You can turn 
stocks and bonds fairly easily into cash. You can turn inventory into cash somewhat easily, but you can't turn your house into cash very easily. You can't tur turn a truck into cash very easily. So the definition of liquidity is actually the speed at which you convert it to cash at market value. And that's what ties up a lot of companies. So there's what we call an order of liquidity. And that's all bean counters. When, we, when you look at a balance sheet, it's in the order of how liquid the assets are. The first and most liquid asset is cash. Cash is king. If you have cash, you can pay your bills, you can run your company, you can make your payroll. The next is short-term investments, bonds, stocks, uh, things like that. They take a little bit more time to liquidate, but you can still get them into cash pretty quickly. Then comes the big issue that a lot of companies find out is inventory. It seems like it should be pretty liquid and pretty easy to turn into cash, but if you don't manage it very well, you can get yourself into a problem with too much inventory. Then other current assets, trucks, vehicles, buildings, and stuff like that, computers. If you're heavily invested in that stuff, it's very hard to turn that into cash and pay your bills. And of course, fixed assets are the least liquid. So alarm companies, no matter who they are, face working capital issues. Installation margins have always been tight. I've been in this industry over 30 years. Uh, nobody's making a ton of money in installations. You're providing a lot of your transactions providing to your customers are essentially credit transactions. Unless you're getting paid in advance, unless you're getting paid as you go in advance, uh, a lot of times you're actually extending credit to a customer and it can build up a very large collection pro uh, practice over the fact that people don't always pay those credit transactions very timely or quickly and they can leave you holding a lot of, uh, lot of issues and none of you start out to be a bank. Uh, alarm companies have few liquid assets. You don't have a lot of cash in the bank. You don't have a lot of securities you can liquidate. So you're looking for sources of liquidity, looking for source of capital. So what are problems with not having liquidity? Well, first, payroll has to be made every week, every couple of weeks. You gotta make your payroll. You can't go back to your employees and negotiate like you can with a supplier. You can't pay them late. You can't ask them to, to get paid when you get paid. It's gotta get made right away. Then you've got, your monitoring costs, your central station uh, costs like that, you got to pay those pretty promptly. Not a lot of central stations will let you float for two or three months before you pay them. And creation costs, what it's costing you to put in new systems are fairly high and fairly competitive. You're not making the margins that you want to, and some of you are losing money on your installs, whether you know it or not, and that's eating up your cash. So what are barriers to liquidity? Monitoring rates are fairly stagnant. I've been in this industry for over 30 years and I'm not seeing monitoring rates go up very much. I'm seeing other services like alarm.com and radio and stuff like that, but you're typically not charging a lot more for those extra services. You're not gonna get any more cash in your business by raising your monitoring rates typically. Payroll costs are inelastic. You can't go back to your employees and say, look, we're having some tough times when everybody to take a 20% pay cut. It ain't gonna happen. Uh, third party monitoring charges have always been fairly low. They're not gonna get any lower. And if anything, they're probably gonna go up. Installation revenue shrinking and valuations of RMR are trending downward. We've had numerous factors. That's a whole other presentation why valuations of RMR are going down. So what are some additional barriers to you being liquid and having cash? Materials prices are at rock bottom. Uh, the, the, the panels, the, the alarm panels, everything you have is pretty competitive but the distributors and manufacturers are selling those things rock bottom. Suppliers are tightening credit terms. What does that mean? 25 years ago, you could go to a distributor like ADI and uh, get 90 day terms and actually have enough money in those 90 day terms to cover all your purchase for, purchases for 90 days. They're really cutting back and they have been for the last 10 or 15 years on how big your credit limit can be and how much you can take advantage of those longer terms. Systems integration is more capital intensive. More companies are installing uh, thermostats, cameras, uh, access control. Uh, those require a lot of purchases right away. The margins are very competitive, especially on the residential side, and that can eat up a lot of cash. So what's the significance in the downward trend in RMR valuations? Lenders are looking at RMR and wondering how you're going to sell the RMR to pay off their loan. And that's becoming more and more of an issue lately because we've had some high profile uh, loans that have had some, some issues. And your company's got to find either other sources of profitability or other uh, sources of cash. And this reverses a trend. So why is it important to be bankable? Why is it important to have the ability to go to a bank and, and borrow some money? Well, I have a lot of guys that tell me they're really debt free, but I look on their balance sheet and they've got their average payable, accounts payable are 60 days. 
uh, they're paying their distributors at uh, 60 to 90 days. They're paying their central station 60 days in arrear. They're borrowing money from all those people. There's no question that they're in debt. They're just in debt to the wrong places. So they're not paying manufacturers, distributors. They got capital leases. They're leasing copiers. They're leasing trucks. They're leasing vehicles. They're stretching their accounts payable. They've got debt. It's just not with where they think their debt is. So why would you incur debt? If you want to grow your company, a lot of times you got to go out and borrow the money to do it. You may have to add a new installer. You may have to need to add a new vehicle. Uh, you may want to purchase RMR. You may want to purchase fixed assets. You may want to acquire a competitor. You may want to enter a new market segment. If you're a fire company, you may want to get into systems integration. If you're an integrator, you may want to get into fire. Uh, geographic uh, expansion, going into a market and buying a company that's already operating there to expand. So why else would you incur debt? To finance installations, and that's something that's, that's a little tricky, but something that can be done. And to do what I call subsidized systems, not giving away systems that are free, but maybe for larger installs, helping subsidize the cost of it and, and getting more recurring revenue or service agreements. Long-term projects. We've had a couple uh, clients that have had uh, installations that are over five or $600,000 and uh, they needed some way to finance while they were getting paid. Maybe it's a governmental installation or a university or somebody where it's gonna take them four or five months to get paid. They needed to borrow some money. In-house leasing. That's kind of scary, but it's something that can be done if you do it right. Uh, large contracts, a, a big contract with a with a user you know you're, is going to pay you, but they're not going to pay you until the installation is done. Government contracts. Why else should you incur debt? Changing your business structure. They're, you're taking in partners. You're buying somebody out. You're doing something different. Succession planning. There are a lot of sellers that want to, in effect, give the company to their kids. They want to take out some money to retire on. So succession planning is a big need for debt. Buy out a partner or investor. These partnerships sound really good when you get into them, but sometimes they can get a little tenuous and you want to buy out that partner, buy out that investor. It's another good reason for debt. Buy out a former spouse. Uh, I do 15 or 20 divorce valuations a year. And the biggest issue we run into there is how is the husband going to buy out the wife or how is the wife going to buy out the husband? So you may want to borrow money from your bank to do that and to retire. You may want to retire, let the company uh, operate without you there all the time, but you want to take some money out. So why would you go with debt? Why would you borrow money from a bank rather than taking on an investor? Well, first of all, debt is usually less expensive. A bank is used to loaning money. Uh, they're borrowing money in effect from their customers on a CD at maybe a half percent and reloaning it out at prime weight or prime plus one or two. They're making pretty good money off of that. Whereas an equity investor is taking people that could be making investments into other uh, areas and they're looking for, and there, there's a lot of risk in those investments, they're looking for returns at 10, 15%. Interest is tax deductible. If you have a loan from a bank and you're paying interest, that's tax deductible. If you have an equity investor and you're paying them dividends, that's not tax deductible. So you've got to consider that in the cost of borrowing. Debt is less intrusive. If you borrow money from a bank, they just want you to send financial statements and let them know that everything's going okay and maybe get uh, give them some more information. If you borrow money from your brother-in-law, he's gonna call you every other week and see how things are going. And if you buy a new car, he's gonna say, why are you buying a new car with my money? Equity can be very intrusive. Lenders tend to be more flexible. If you have to go back to a lender and say, look, we've had a pandemic, we've had COVID issues, uh, we, our customers aren't paying us. We need, to loan, need, us, need you to loan us some more money or need you to give us a few more months to pay. Lenders are in a position to do that, whereas equity investors may be tapped out and may be looking to get their money back and not willing to work with you. And with debt, there's no predefined exit strategy. They want you at some point to pay their loan off and move on down the road, but it's not like an equity investment where investors come into your company for four or five years, and in that fifth year, they expect to be paid off completely. And if you have debt, you retain more control of your business. If you start selling off your stock uh, as equity, you lose some of the control of your business. But what's wrong with debt? Too much debt can really strain your working capital. Too much debt, too much interest, too high a payment can really hurt you. It's very important when you're looking on taking on debt to make sure that you can afford the monthly payments. Lenders generally require an equity mix. I have a lot of people come to me, say they wanna buy a company and they wanna buy, borrow all the money to do, uh, to do the transaction from a lender. 
and they don't want to put any of their assets at risk. Lenders want to see you in this game and see you playing with it and some of your RMR at risk or some of your assets or money at risk before they'll do a loan. Some lenders may rush to foreclose. There have been some transactions in the past and some lenders in the past that decide they want to pull out of the market, decide they didn't want to loan anymore, and uh, they look for reasons to foreclose on a loan. And the biggest issue we have here is that most lenders, most banks, most specialty lenders, they don't understand the alarm industry. They look at this business and say, what in the world is going on? They don't understand RMR, so that's a big issue. So what are the types of lenders that are out there? The first is a local and regional bank. They don't understand the industry, so don't expect them to understand what you do, but they will make small loans up to $300,000 if they know you and they feel comfortable with you. And a good example is, most local banks, a uh, bank officer there usually has what they call discretionary ability. They can make a loan of up to $50,000, $100,000, $250,000, dollars depending on how long they've been with the bank and how much authority they have, just based on how they feel about you as a, as a manager, how they feel about you as a person and your credit. And local and regional banks, their loans are reasonably priced. They're again borrowing money at half a percent to 1% on CDs and loaning it back out on 5%. So as long as they feel comfortable, the loans for the right reason, they'll make those all day. That's how they make their money. So specialty lenders, and when we talk about specialty lenders, that would be companies like AFS, who did some presentations a few weeks ago that really understand the industry and really understand RMR and regard RMR as an asset and see this off balance sheet asset as something they can loan against. And they'll generally loan $250,000 to $2 million. So that kind of picks up where the local banks leave off and give you an option of a place to go to borrow in that range. And that's why Jim Wooster and his group and a few others that are doing this are a very good resource uh, if you want to uh, get debt to help run your business. They also, and this is very critical, they don't require sophisticated financial reporting. A loan from a larger bank, we'll get into that in a minute, usually takes at least a controller and some pretty sophisticated financial reporting that can cost you anywhere from twenty to $50,000 a year to produce. And if you're only borrowing $200,000, that could be in effect 25% interest in the loan. So if you borrow from AFS, they just want reports on a regular basis telling you, telling them what your RMR is doing. They may lockbox your RMR to, to make sure it's coming through and they may take their payment out of your, out of your cash receipts but they're not asking for a lot of analysis, a lot of budgeting, a lot of reporting, a lot of collateral reports. Uh, especially lenders like AFS, they usually provide revolving debt, which means when you need it, you can draw it down. When you don't need it, you can pay it, uh, you can pay it back down and uh, not end up with a big loan all the time. They're more expensive than a bank. And that the reason for that is because they are monitoring your loan a lot closer. They are a lot more involved in what's going on. And these companies are borrowing from a bank and they're consolidating a bunch of small loans into a large loan. And of course, they're buying money from a bank wholesale and loaning it back out of retail. So they're more expensive, but they're typically not terribly expensive. And you just have to look and see what you're going to do with the money and if it makes sense. They also offer ancillary services like billing and they can uh, some of them have leasing programs and some other options that may help your company. So national banks and these are the big industry lenders that you see out there. They're also an excellent resource, but some of them understand the industry. CIBC understands the industry. Capital One understands the industry. There are a few uh, uh, super regional banks that understand the alarm industry. They're an excellent source for large loans. The loans that they make are based on cash flow, not purely RMR, but also your cash flow, how much cash you have, what your EBITDA is, and how much you're spending to create new accounts. Their minimum loan is a million dollars, and that's kind of optimistic. If they don't see you growing to the point where they can loan you five or six million dollars, they're really not a good option uh, because they don't want to make a lot of small loans. So you need to consider that. They can loan though as much as a hundred million dollars and even more. And if you're a large company, if you're a super regional company, need a lot of money, this is your best option. Uh, they're less expensive per dollar than any other kind of lender, but you have to be borrowing a lot of dollars to make that work but they do require fairly sophisticated financial reporting. One of the things we do is help some of our smaller companies, smaller borrowers do the financial reporting that these banks require, but it does get fairly expensive. So what are lender expectations if you're going to borrow money from a lender? First, all lenders expect integrity and top management. You better be a good guy. You better not be uh, somebody that, that is operating uh, on the edge, uh, somebody they don't feel comfortable with. Uh, you better have good reputations. 
And uh, they want to see that you're managing your cash cycle. They want to see that you're staying on top of your customers. They want to see that you're making sure that you work through your receivables and keep them in 30 to 90 day patterns, that you're uh, taking action with people that get over 90 days, and that you're paying your bills on time and you're paying your vendors on time. And you really take this cash cycle management seriously. They want to see some qualified key people. They want to make sure at least the owner knows what's going on and what's happening. And in a smaller business, the lenders expect to see the owner being multifaceted and being able to do installs and service and customer service and billing and all these other things. And they want to see financial integrity. They want to see that every year you're filing your tax returns on time. They want to see that you're paying your payroll taxes on time. They want to see that from a financial standpoint, there's integrity in your business and they're not going to get surprised uh, because you haven't filed a payroll tax return, you get a tax lien. But more important than anything else, they're getting into financial relationship with you. They want to see that you take finances seriously. So what is a local or regional bank? What does a bank down the street at the corner expect? First and foremost is integrity of the owner. Usually when you're going to a local or regional bank, it's somebody you know. They're in your Rotary Club. They belong to your religious institution. You went to high school with them. They really know you and fully feel comfortable with you. A lot of companies found this out the hard way when the PPP loans came around and they would call a bank to get a loan, didn't know anybody there and they weren't gonna make the loan. The next is the credit worthiness of the owner. Uh, when you're doing a smaller loan, when you're doing something from a regional bank, you're personally guaranteeing it and they're really looking at that personal guarantee to cover them if they made a mistake. And so they're gonna look at your credit. If you've got a lot of credit card balances uh, and you put them into the business, you're paying them off with the, with the loan, that's one thing. But if you're not paying bills on time, and you've had repos and problems like that, you're probably not gonna get a lot of attention from the bank. They're looking for a reasonably strong balance sheet. And what I mean by that is that you keep some cash in the business, uh, your uh, receivables are managed fairly well, and there's not a lot of stuff over 90 days. You're paying your payables on time. You don't have a lot of debt from a lot of places and, and your fixed assets are pretty reasonable. So I wanna see a, a strong balance sheet. And one issue you'll have with a local or regional bank is they expect bottom line profitability. And in a really competitive, especially residential alarm environment where you're losing money on your installs, this could be an issue. And they want to see some type of business plan. What are you going to do with our money? Where are you going to go? How are you going to handle things in the future? Uh, what's going to happen? They want to see some type of business plan. That's one of the biggest issues that small companies have when they go to borrow money. The banker doesn't understand your business. He may or may not know you, but he wants to know, what are you gonna do with my money? If you're going to use it to grow your company, you're gonna use it to boost your cash cycle. You're gonna use it to pay credit card debt off that you've been financing your business with. That's great. If you're gonna buy a half million dollar motor home with it, they may not be real excited about that. So consider that. Uh, what do the specialty lenders expect? People like AFS and Kim Wooster. The first they wanna see good quality monitoring accounts. They wanna make sure that your attrition is low, they want to see that uh, you're you're making installs where you know what you're doing and you're, you're keeping them regional and you're doing a job, good job. They want to see accounts receivable management. Again, you don't have a lot of customers over 90 days. You don't have a lot of issues. Uh, they want to see a reasonable creation cost. By creation cost, I mean, how much do you lose on an installation divided by your RMR? And what I want to see is a lot of guys make pretty good profit on their installations but a lot of residential companies and even some commercial companies lose money on their installs and we want to see when we're talking to a company uh them losing less than 18 times the rmr they're creating that's what creation cost is they want to see sufficient ebitda and everybody throws that word around what does ebitda mean that's your earnings before interest taxes depreciation amortization to cover your debt service what they want to see is that you have enough income before you take out these items to pay the loan because what they don't want to see is that you're borrowing their money and using it to make their loan payments. They want to make sure it's coming out of operating cash flow and that you have a moderate financial staff. Uh, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute, what a moderate financial staff is. A lot of specialty lenders, as you start getting into the larger loans, will require reviewed financial statements. AFS uh, will uh, require compiled up to a certain point, but there is a point where they'll ask for reviewed financials. Uh, one arrangement we have with AFS is if we are dealing with the, cust with the client and the borrower on a regular basis and helping them prepare their own financial statements, a lot of times they'll waive the requirement for the compiled financial statements. They also want to see more and more that you have some geographic concentration. It's not, not unusual to see a company that's gotten a little aggressive 
with their account base and gotten into some areas where they shouldn't have been, maybe two or 300 miles away from their office and they're having trouble making service calls, uh, you need to make sure that, that you're keeping your customers in an area where you can service them and not create a lot of uh, concern and heartburn for your lender. Uh, they wanna see reasonable leverage. If you're borrowing money from them, they wanna see pretty much on a specialty lender's basis that your loan to your RMR is in the teens. So for example, if you if you have $10,000 of uh, RMR, they wanna make sure your loan is 150 to $200,000 or less. So what do national banks expect? If you're borrowing less than $10 million, they wanna see some management depth. They don't wanna see the owner doing everything. They don't wanna see a married couple where uh, pop goes out and installs the alarm and mom does the books. They wanna see some depth. They wanna see excellent account quality. They wanna see very low attrition. They wanna see very concentrated account base. They wanna see some retained earnings. They wanna see that year after year, you've had profitability and that you've built your company and that you're keeping money in the company uh, and not taking it all out and spending it. They wanna see available capital. They wanna see that you can come up with cash without having to go to them all the time uh, to borrow money. They wanna see that you have consistent performance, that year after year, you're making money and that you're not just having uh, a fluke that you had five or six years of losses and all of a sudden you started making money. It doesn't hurt with the national bank to see some outside directors in your company. And I don't mean stockholders. Uh, that's a whole other presentation that we, we do from time to time is how to build an advisory board how to involve your bankers, how to involve your attorneys, how to involve some other people in, uh, in what's going on in your company and get some outside advice. It's a very good thing to have when you're going to a national bank. They wanna see long-term planning, typically a three to five year budget. Here's what my revenue is going to be. Here's what my expenses are going to be. Here's where I'm gonna to need to borrow money from you, Mr. Banker, and here's how I'm gonna pay it off. Uh, they wanna see conservative leverage. They wanna see multiples of debt to RMR in the teens and low 20s. They don't wanna see you having to borrow 35 times your new RMR you're putting in. They wanna see that your EBITDA is going to increase after you take out the loan. They wanna see that this loan is going to be what we call accretive. It's going to grow the business, it's gonna build the business, and what you do with the money is going to cause your income to go up. And they wanna see a fairly professional financial staff, usually a controller, somebody that really knows what's going on and understands the accounting side and can get them reliable, accurate tax returns and financial statements on a regular basis. And they wanna see accrual basis financial statements. You're gonna to have to move out of the cash world and at least provide them accrual basis financial statements, whether you wanna do tax returns or not accrual basis, if you're allowed to is another thing, but they wanna see accrual basis financials. They wanna match that revenue up with expenses. So if you're borrowing more than $10 million, what does a bank look for? They look for RMR greater than half a million dollars. They look for outstanding financial staff, usually a CFO, uh, somebody that really can take control of that financial staff and, and work without input from the owner. They're looking for strong software and internal control structure. If you're using QuickBooks, they're probably not interested in talking to you, but if you're using MicroKey, Sedona, one of the industry specific softwares, MAS, uh, that makes them happy. And they want internal control structure. They want checks and balances and how things are happening and how bills are being paid and, and uh, elimination of fraud and mistakes and, and things like that. They're looking for outside capital sources. A lot of times when you're borrowing that much money, you're having to go outside to investors and get capital to run your business. Looking for moderate leverage around 20 times. They're looking for very strong EBITDA. Uh, year after year, you're, you're bringing money to the bottom line and that EBITDA is growing and it will grow with your loan. They're looking for multifaceted management with depth in each department, service manager, installation manager, and assistant managers, and people that are that are fairly deep. So if somebody disappears or gets hit by a meteor, you can still run your business. They want strong operational capabilities. They want a company that knows what they're doing and keeps their customers happy and get their gets their installs made. Uh, they want a major presence in the market. They want to see a company that really is known in the market instead of a company that's spread all over the place and doesn't have really a lot of market standing and a heavy em emphasis on planning and, and performance management. They wanna see month after month budgets, comparing uh, budget to actual, comparing this month to last month, comparing year to date to what you expected. Uh, they wanna see attrition being monitored, not just by how many accounts canceled, but why they canceled and where they went. They usually, at this level alone, they're gonna ask for audited financials. And an audit is a true experience because you're asking an independent CPA to step in and make give an opinion on your financial statements. And that can be a very expensive and very arduous process if you don't have these other things addressed. So what are financial capabilities? The first is basic. 
Uh, that's a small company with a, with a, a bookkeeper or a billing person, just adequate accounts payable and accounts receivable. Current asset and liability accounts reconciled monthly, reconciling the billing, uh, the, the uh, bank accounts, reconciling the fixed assets, reconciling the AR and the AP to make sure you got your hand, hand on them. They want the owner supervising receivables and, and payables. That's typically the owner signing the checks, the owner approving the payables when they go out the door, making sure nothing's happening without the owner knowing what's going on. Basic tax compliance, payroll tax returns being filed on time, things happening and things, things going on in a timely basis. Annual financial statements, adequate computerized financial systems, this typically means QuickBooks, but hopefully you can move up to one of the industry specific softwares. Uh, intermediate capabilities, this is when you're going to uh, get a loan from a, from a real bank. A full charge bookkeeper or accountant, by full charge bookkeeper, we, I mean somebody that really knows the accounting process up and down. Monthly reconciliation of every account on that balance sheet, that you know what's in, what's in that account and where it's going. A monthly balance sheet and a monthly income statement that are somewhat accurate. Segregation of function. The person that collects the checks and makes the deposit isn't the person that, that posts the payments. Things like that that give you some internal control to make sure they're not mistakes and, and irregularities causing problems for your business. Industry-specific computer systems. Sedona, MicroKey, MAS, something that's industry-specific and gives you reliable data besides just financial data. data. <coughs> And this is something that's becoming more and more required, data backup and offsite storage. They don't want to find out one day that you got hacked or uh, your computer went down and everything's gone. And RMR nutrition reporting. They want to know your RMR month by month, why they're adding, why they're canceling, <coughs> and where they went. And credit and collections. And this is where Ken's firm comes in, is you're watching your receivables. You're watching your, your uh, credit that you're extending and you're collecting well and you're staying on top of people. At least compile financial statements annually where they are in a cruel basis and they make sense and they're somewhat accurate. What are advanced financial capabilities? A controller, somebody that's an accountant that knows the entire area of accounting. A cruel basis financial statements are absolutely a must. The focus on the balance sheet and focus on cash flow, not just income. Strong internal controls, making sure you're minimizing fraud and minimizing errors. Segment and profitability reporting. How is my install segment doing? How's my fire division doing? How's my access control division doing? Reviewed financial statements. This means that a CPA's looked at your financial statements and dug down a little bit and made sure that they seem somewhat accurate. Industry specific billing and operations applications. And internal financial reporting. You've got uh, employees inside your company that are responsible for segments of the business. And the controller assists the owner in your bank and investor communication. So you're not the only one talking to the bank, you've got the controller going with you to talk to them. So last is superior, my superior is a chief financial officer. This isn't just an accountant, this is a super accountant. And that person would focus on not just the accounting, but planning, budgeting, and financial performance management. That's very critical. And cash management, making sure that you have adequate cash to pay your bills and operate your company and getting you reliable, timely, and relevant financial information. And what we talk about with relevant is that what you're getting from your accounting department actually gives you information that helps you run your company. Significant invest, investment in enterprise hardware and software, that you've got a really nice accounting system that actually helps you run your business. And audited financials with quarterly reviews, which means every year you're getting an audit and quarterly your CPAs are looking through your financial statements and reviewing them and saying that yes, these look okay. Now here's a big difference between a CFO and a controller. In a company with a CFO that has a large loan and has large facilities and large financial issues, the CFO maintains the relationship with the bankers and investors. The president may oversee it, but the CFO is the one that talks to the bank and talks about their, their banking performance and bank reporting. So what is planning? When we talk about planning, what are we talking about? We're talking about managing your cash flow in the future, making sure you have enough cash and growing the business, making sure that you're taking money and setting it aside to grow your business and, and become larger and become, become more efficient. We're also talking about measuring performance. You're giving your department managers a budget. You're giving yourself a budget and evaluating yourself and how you uh, respond to that. So what are the elements of good planning? Budgeting of revenues and expenses. Very few companies in this industry have a budget and it is so critical to have a budget and see how you thought you were going to be doing and how you actually did. Cash flow projections. 
where are you going to be this time next year and what's going to happen to your cash? And should you start looking at going to a bank and asking for money now or going to someplace and borrowing money now? Don't just quit making paying your payables, uh, but your cash flow. Pro forma balance sheets, what are we talking about here? We're talking about a year or two in the future. What's your balance sheet going to look like? And this is something you probably have to involve a firm like us or your outside accountants to do, but it's very important. What is your company going to look like in the future? Because if you want to be strong, you've got to have a strong balance sheet. Capital expenditure budgeting. When are my trucks going to wear out? When are my computers going to be obsolete? When are we going to have to uh, buy new furniture and buy new items? You need to look at this in the future, not just wait until a truck breaks down and go out and buy it. You need to understand what your needs are going to be and start planning for that today. Contingency and disaster planning. We've been going through a pandemic right now. We don't know when we're going to come out. But what are you going to do and how are you going to survive and what and how are you going to get through it? And then finally, succession planning. And that's one thing that Ken and I run into all the time is owners that suddenly decide that they've had enough or they pass away or something unexpected happens. What's going to happen to your company and who's going to own it and operate and run it? And location planning. Are you going to outgrow your building? Do you want to buy a building? Do you want to lease a building? What are you going to do? And then finally, strategic marketing and operational planning. If you're going to get into new segments and do new things and react to new things that are coming down the road, how are you going to do that? So how do you upgrade your financial capabilities? First, engage competent financial professionals. The guy in the corner that does income taxes for individuals probably isn't your guy. Uh, involve your financial professionals with your business. My best clients are the ones that call me from time to time. We just spent uh, half an hour with a client planning for next year and planning for things before the end of the year, so there are no surprises. Communicate with your banker. I always tell my clients, call your banker when things are good. Uh, go eat lunch with them a couple of times a year. Be the person that's calling them to give them good news and talk about good things. So when you do need them, uh, they're ready to talk to you. Appoint outside directors, lawyers, insurance people, uh, accountants, uh, people from the community. Put them on your advisory board and have an advisory board meeting every year and say, look, guys, this is what I'm doing. What do you think? Hire financial staff who are competent. A lot of people want to save money on their financial staff and they end up with people that really don't work well. And we run into a lot of people that are mainly working 15, 20 hours a week and aren't getting the job done. Uh, outsource functions if necessary. If you have to outsource some of your financial reporting to a firm like ours, do that so you can focus on what you really do. And finally, purchase adequate computer applications and hardware. So, if you do get a financial tune-up from a firm like ours, first we review your accounting systems and reports. Then we monitor, we, we look at your monitoring agreements and we send them, we look at them from a marketing standpoint, but then we'll send them to somebody like Ken and say, what do you think about this contract? Or have you just call Ken and engage him to rewrite your contract? Uh, operational review, what are you doing and how are you doing it? And should you be doing it this way? Logistics review. Uh, how are things, how are goods and materials and things passing through your business? How are you managing your vehicles? How are you doing your stuff? Legal review, bringing in Ken to look at how you handle lawsuits, how you handle planning, how you handle things that are of a legal nature and uh, leases, agreements, liens, things like that that are out there. Marketing strategy, uh, you should talk to somebody that's an expert in marketing and figure out how you're marketing and what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. Uh, capital expenditure budgeting. That's something very critical. We talked about that and something you should look at doing. And pro forma modeling, including your balance sheets. What's your balance sheet going to look like in the future? So that's pretty much it. And Ken, I don't know if you've gotten some questions, but I'm glad to answer questions as you see them. I'm going to turn uh, this PowerPoint screen off. You still out there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm lot here. To, lot to take in. Well, it was a tremendous amount to take in. And let me tell everyone who's on here, uh, let me give you the idea if you haven't thought of it yet. Uh, this presentation has been recorded. It will be on our website, the K&K website, uh, as all of our uh, webinars uh, are posted there. So you should have your CFOs and your accountants listen to this. I know that uh, Mitch isn't in the business of training your accountants. He'd prefer you call him. But uh, uh, if you're going to have a, a accountants, all of this information that Mitch provided is absolutely vital and essential to a successful operation. So we have a, a question. If a dealer does not have financial statements, how do you suggest they start to come up with them? 
<laughs> well, call us or call an accounting firm and and have them help you put together your financial statements. I, I, uh, financial statements are pretty critical to your business and they're not easy to do. And uh, just because you have QuickBooks doesn't mean you have uh, reliable or accurate or relevant financial statements. So reach out to us or reach out to an accountant and pay them some money to help you get them done initially and then see if they can give you, like we do, enough input to keep doing them on a going forward, uh, forward basis. Great question. Do you do you think it's 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 important to have an independent uh, accounting firm engaged? In, in this industry, a lot of the smaller companies they don't really have a lot to keep an accountant going, a controller and accountant going all all month. They 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 want to focus on their billing, they want to focus on their job costing, and they want to focus on getting customers billed and paying their bills. And so you can hire for a reasonable amount of money, somebody that can do that, but they get a little uh, stammered when it comes to actually preparing financial statements and getting things that make sense. Whereas if you hired a controller and you've got them spending 30 hours a week sending out bills and posting payments, they're gonna be bored and they're getting overpaid for what they're doing. So there are plenty of firms that's included that a lot of our clients pay us a few hundred dollars a month uh, to help their billing person, help their bookkeeper uh, to prepare the financial statements and get these reports done and let them focus on what they really do well, which is billing and making sure payables are getting paid because uh, billing in this industry is a huge issue. And uh, it's not uncommon for a small company of eight or 900 accounts, they got a bill every month and that's where that person would be spending their time. If you're providing that service, uh, uh, spending a few hours a month uh, for a uh, alarm company, is that considered an independent um, audit or, or, or accountant? It, it's, it's not because what we're doing is providing pure bookkeeping services in, in, in that situation. We're, we're actually, you can't be independent from the company if you're actually making financial decisions. And in this case, we're looking at things and saying, this is how we're going to do it. And this is how uh, you're, we're, we're going to structure it. And that's something that's come about in the last 20 years in the accounting profession. Auditors that you see, the, the CPA firms that do audits, which we don't do, uh, they are independent and they're they're taking a look at what you've already done and saying did you do it right in our you, case you don't you don't, you don't do independent uh um you won't provide an independent uh uh audit no we we, we don't because to do that we'd have to be licensed in, in all 50 states and and uh what we do do though is our clients that have reviews and and audits which have to be conducted by an independent firm we put together what's called the, we, we help them prepare the financial statements and we do the disclosures uh, that are required for the financial statements and provide what are called the work papers, the way that the outside CPAs test these transactions. That's entirely proper for us to do. Then we send all this information to their outside CPAs and all they've got to do is test the work that we've done for the client and make sure that they feel comfortable with it and, feel, and th that they're okay with what they've done. And a good example is, an audit can easily run twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars. If we've done this work and prepared all these work papers, they're not having to use their CPAs in the middle of their most busy season to prepare all this stuff. Plus, it allows them to stay independent, and not make these decisions. So we'll do this for a client for three or four thousand dollars, and the CPA will shave anywhere from eight to fifteen thousand dollars off the bill because everything that they're pulling their hair out to try to get done, we've already pulled our hair out to get done and we've had a relationship with the client all year. Now, in situations like Jim Wooster's uh, firm AFS, they require compiled financial statements from their uh, from their clients, which means a somewhat independent uh, firm has gone through and made sure that things make sense, make sure that their, uh, their cash is stated properly, make sure that things are consistent, make sure things are happening well. To go to a CPA and get that done can cost you anywhere from, uh, three to $6,000, depending on the quality of the books. Jim will allow his customers to come to us and let us help them with their bookkeeping and give them the entries to make themselves so they can prepare the financial statements in house and, and give them to Jim. And he has enough confidence in us recognizing issues and recognizing problems that he'll accept that in lieu of a compiled financial statement. Why does a bank care about an industry specific software over QuickBooks? Uh, a bank is looking for, especially the national banks alone in this industry, they want you using your financial results to monitor attrition because that's what they're most concerned about. How's your RMR doing? So if you're using Sedona, if you're using MicroKey, if you're using ProBill, if you're using some of these other software, 
They're monitoring your RMR month after month. QuickBooks will send the bill out just fine. Uh, it'll post a payment when you get it back, but it's not going to tell you why your customers canceled or how many customers canceled or what your arm was, RMR was a compute deferred revenue. For example, if you bill a customer out for a whole quarter, a $30 customer in QuickBooks, it's going to take $90 to your revenue that month. In the next two months, it's going to take $0 to your revenue. And the banks don't like to see that. They like to see if you got 50,000 of RMR, they like to see month after month, $50,000 hitting that revenue column, not 20,000 one month, 70,000 the next month, and uh, 45,000 the next month. So they like to see that, but more important than anything else, they wanna see, this is your biggest asset. This is your RMR. This is why we do the contracts. This is why we track RMR. Why are, you, why are your customers canceling? Where are they coming from? What's it costing to put them in? And how are you managing that most valuable asset you have? And you can't do that with QuickBooks. You can't do that with uh, Peachtree. You can only do it with industry-specific software. And that's why it's such a good investment to go out and get industry-specific software uh, once you get past being a mom and pop company. Okay. Well, we don't have any other questions. Last, last call on questions. Uh, Mitch, I want to thank you. That was a really comprehensive webinar and uh, I know people are going to have to go back and look at it to uh, uh, remember everything that you said uh, so since there are no other questions I want to thank Mitch for the presentation I want to thank you all for attending and uh, let's all get back to the election results how's that <laughs> okay bye everybody bye 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 bye